Hello everyone, this is Pastor Lewis Showers coming to you from Grace Baptist Church here in Washington, Indiana. We're located in a red brick building up on a hill right behind Boat's Pizza off of State Road 57 in Washington. We would cordially welcome you to come on out and to visit with us. We may be a smaller congregation, but we do worship well. And we know that it'll be a real blessing to you if you come out and join with us. You can also find additional information and ministry uh, by going to our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube website and in the search bar, type in Grace Baptist Church, Washington, Indiana. Likewise, there is much uh, that can be gleaned from our website. And the website, it can be found at gbcwashingtonin.com or just Google Grace Baptist Church, Washington, Indiana. It'll bring you to our website. You'll find a number of audio and video messages as well as a number of articles written on subject matters that are often in the minds of people regarding the Bible. So we hope that you'll come back and do that. Now, this Sunday, November the 29th, we had planned a special praise service. We've done this for the last several years. We invite our Latino congregation to join us, and it is a bilingual service. It is really, truly a marvelous service and a real blessing. Unfortunately, with the spike in COVID, we've had to cancel the service. And so this didn't give me much time to get something prepared to put on YouTube for this week uh, to minister to our people. So what I've done is I've gone back to the archive, pulled the sermon on Thanksgiving that I did back in 2012, added video to it, and uh, have then put that up on online so that you will be able to profit, hopefully, from it. Uh, hope that it will be a real blessing as we look at the American Thanksgiving. to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to have a little bit of a history lesson this morning. American history as well as ancient history. This being the week leading up to Thanksgiving, I felt it wise to preach on Thanksgiving. Uh, my message is entitled this morning, The American Thanksgiving. It, it truly is a unique time. Not many countries celebrate this. But this nation still does, and uh, I want to go back in time and take a look at uh, why we celebrate it and uh, learn some lessons from it. In Philippians chapter 4, beginning of verse 10, Paul writes these words, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care for me is flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Father, we pray that as we look at uh, the background to the American Thanksgiving. May we see it not just as something as a secular event of history, but may we understand and appreciate the religious implications of this event. And I pray, Father, as we look at what the original pilgrims went through in order to come to the point where they could have the first Thanksgiving, it should speak to our own hearts about where we are and what we do expect for this time of year. May we truly reflect upon you and reflect upon your goodness. May we truly have a Thanksgiving in our hearts this morning. And I pray, Father, the Spirit of God will work in all that takes place, and we ask this in your name. Amen. For those of you that were here Wednesday night, you know that uh, as I was working on this study this week, I came across a few websites, uh, and I don't know why I was really too surprised about it, but uh, there is an alternative version to Thanksgiving that is out there. 
Uh, there is one website, in fact, that they are recommending to our young people in our schools, our public schools, to, to be taught this alternative view of Thanksgiving. And in this alternative view of Thanksgiving, they say basically what we have always been taught and what we hold to as Thanksgiving is nothing more than a myth. It was conjured up to explain why it was that we came to America and we colonized America and in the, play, in, in the process replaced the Indians and how that uh, the pilgrims were really bad guys, not good guys. And I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable some of the stuff that's being written. We call them revisionists. Most of their opinions and ideas and things that they have conjured up really all go back to grabbing a little something out of context here and grabbing something out of context here and putting together something that fits their idea of the way things really are. Well, we're going to lay those alternative ideas aside and we're going to talk about the truth this morning. And I, I want to take you in the early part of the message through the journey of the pilgrims. Now, please note something that history often does not bring out, but it's the truth. Pilgrims were separatists. Pilgrims were separatists. A lot of people say, hey, you know, they were Puritans. No, they were not. They were separatists. Uh, guess who also is called separatists? We are. They were in, in very many ways, doctrinally, right down the line with what we believe. And what was originally taught and held to by the original church. It was this group that was heavily persecuted and which made up most of the settlers during the first 30 years of the settling of the colony. After about 30 years, then there was a Puritan movement that had taken place in England, and it was a growing movement, and it was one of these movements where it had no tolerance for any other group other than themselves, and basically what they did was they came in, and they came in with so many numbers to that area that they basically told the pilgrims, you cannot worship the way you feel free to worship. And they kicked anyone who disagreed with them and tried to worship according to their conscience. They kicked them out of the colony. And the Puritans took over. Well, that's good news. Because one of those Purit or pilgrims that was kicked out of the colony, his name was Roger Williams. Roger Williams established a new colony known as Rhode Island. And one of the things that Roger Williams established in Rhode Island was freedom of worship. And he determined that anyone who came to the, that particular colony, regardless of what they believed, they would have the freedom to worship as they felt their conscience would dictate. And it was that idea that began to spread throughout the colonies. It was a revolutionary idea. It was so contrary to what was being practiced in Europe and other parts of the world. And that idea spread throughout the colonies, and with maybe the exception of Maryland, all the other colonies pretty much began to practice this idea, and that was also therefore included in our Constitution. And so we have the freedom to worship today as we feel our conscience would lead us or as we say it, according to what God's word would tell us. And we need not fear that, um, say, the Catholics are going to come in and march in with the police and lock the place up and arrest us because we're not worshiping that way, or uh, the Episcopalians or the Lutherans or whatever. They have their church. We may not agree with them, but we believe in tolerance because of Christian liberty and freedom of worship and therefore we allow them to go ahead and worship the way they feel they ought to worship we worship the way we ought to worship that's the true meaning behind tolerance 
Unfortunately, the word tolerance has been given a wrong and a bad meaning today. By today's terms, tolerance means you will accept our politically correct ideas or you will not be tolerant. And that's not what tolerance was all about. You know, well, that's a side note, and I'm not going to get off on that, and I'm getting away from what I need to be preaching about this morning. That's just a little bit of a background on the pilgrims. But let me get into a little bit more detail about them. As we look at Thanksgiving as it was first founded in Plymouth Rock, Massachusetts, we need to know a little bit of the background behind why it was that these pilgrims came to the United States. There was a need to, of freedom to worship. In the country of England during the late 1500s and early 1600s, revival began to spread among the people. Uh, one of the things that drove this great revival was, of course, the access to the English Bible. That's why Bibles and getting Bibles in the hands of people is so very, very important. Because when Bibles are placed in the hands of people, people begin to study them. They discover the truth of God. And that is the very reason why many denominations and groups over the Middle Ages oftentimes denied the Bible from the layperson. Why? Because they were afraid if they learned what the Bible said, they would depart from them and turn to the truth. And that's exactly what was happening in England. Governor William Bradford writes the following, with the word of some godly preachers, many people became enlightened by the word of God and they began to reform their lives. When they began to live in the light of God's word, they were scoffed and scorned by the multitude. The ministers were told to follow the laws of the Church of England or else be silent. And the poor people were sorely vexed by the spying of the church officers and the actions of the courts. Therefore, these people, seeing their religious liberties being restricted, if not totally denied, decided they must find a haven in which they would be able to be free to worship. And not only to worship God, but also to be able to take the word of God to others and share it with them as well. And so, therefore, they had this quest for freedom. And that started by first finding a home in the Netherlands. Seeing no hope for improving their lot in life, these saints of God sought to find asylum in the country of Holland or the Netherlands, where religious freedom was practiced. In 1607, the captain of the boat that they hired decided to make some extra money by turning them in. Can you imagine that? They, they spent all this money to get voyage to Holland where they would get religious freedom. They get on board the boat. Just as they're getting on board the boat, the police all of a sudden show up. And they arrest them all because the captain took the money from the pilgrims and then made money by turning them in, and they were imprisoned. Well, similar failure took place in 1608, and it was not until 1609 that they finally arrived in Holland. And though they found the freedom to worship God, they also found that the living conditions there were worse than even poverty. As one writer has written, many preferred and chose the prisons of England to the liberty of Holland. Many were becoming old before their time. They had to press their children into heavy labor. Their bodies bowed under the weight and many became worn out in their youth. And by now we should probably have a picture or two of uh, some of the prisons that these individuals were being cast into. Well, since the Netherlands were not a good place to continue on in, they decided that they would go to a new place, another possible haven of rest and liberty. They chose, therefore, to come to the Americas, and they had planned to come to the Virginia colony. Now, understand something. Where they planned to locate was not in Virginia. 
In case you think that that's where they intended to go, that's not the case. In actuality, the Virginia colony at that time extended all the way up to Manhattan. That's in New York, of course. And that's where they were hoping to locate, right around the Hudson River. However, because of the, some storms and complications, they ended up in Massachusetts just the same. Now, I want to look at this voyage that they took to come to America. I think what it tells us is just how important worshiping God was to these people. They so wanted to worship God and do it in liberty, they were willing to endure some of the greatest of suffering, more suffering than I think many of us in our America today would even be willing to even consider. They finally were able to gather enough money together to hire two boats at great expense. And by the way, they were not the greatest of boats. They did this in September 1620, only to have to return after a few short weeks due to leaks in the ships. So that tells you a little bit about the condition of the boats that they hired. Sailing in cramped quarters with no privacy for nine weeks, the pilgrims landed finally, not in Virginia as they'd hoped, but in Plymouth, Massachusetts, in November 1620. Now I want you to look for a moment at the boat. I've been on the Mayflower too, uh, and I can tell you something right now. This boat is smaller than a lot of people's yachts. And to think that you had 30-some crew, and then you had over 102 passengers crammed into the cargo hold it is an amazing thing when you think about it. And then to have them be there inside that boat for literally nine weeks, actually it's going to be a lot longer than that, uh, as we'll see in a moment, that when they get there, it's winter time is coming on. They stay in that boat until the springtime and they can get out and begin to build themselves places in which to live. Let's look at this boat. It is not a passenger ship. It isn't like going out on a cruise, in a cruise liner, okay? It was a boat that was not even designed to carry people. It was a boat designed to carry freight. And it wasn't that good a boat and it was a very small boat. It has been said that the boat reeked with the smell of wine that had been transported on that ship. And of course, the containers in those days were not always as tight as they ought. And wine had spilled from time to time upon the very floors of which they would now dwell. And that wine had gone into the wood and fermented and caused quite a stench. This boat was in such bad repair and condition, the Mayflower, that when they returned the boat to England, the owner of the boat decided to scrap it. So it wasn't like they got the biggest boat or got the best boat or the passenger boat uh, would provide the best. No, all they could scrape up was enough money to get some old beat-up boat that might make it all the way to America. It was designed to haul no more than a total of 30 additional passengers. In other words, if it was hauling, uh, going someplace, it could take up to 30 additional passengers. But they were instead going to add 102 additional passengers. Now all of a sudden we see the cramped conditions. Uh, as we look at the boat, we note that it is an old boat. And now we're going to get into some pictures to give you a little better idea of what the size of this boat was. It was a small boat of only about 90 feet long, that is, from the one end to the other. And in a moment, a picture will come up, hopefully. And uh, this boat, when you see it, you'll notice that the 90 feet is not all wide, spacious place where you could put people, but a lot of it was extended over that people didn't live in, but rather were a part of the rigging and so forth. It would be equivalent of taking two trailers, semi-trailers, and putting them back to back. That's about the length of this boat. To put it in other terms, 
If we use go from the baptismal tank to the back of the church here, it would be approximately the size, lengthwise, of this boat that could be inhabited. But I want you to go a little bit further on this. That boat would not have been as wide as this auditorium. Actually, this boat is about the width of 12 people in a row standing, and I can prove that to you. Let's go to the next picture. The next picture shows the boat as it is anchored. This is the Mayflower 2 as it is anchored. And I don't know if you can see from where you're at where some of the people are, but if you can and could make them out, you would be surprised at how large they are in relationship to the boat itself. Now, let me show you just how tight this whole thing is. Go to the next picture. Can you see some of the people that are on the boat? Do you see how wide that is? Click on it there for Mary. That last arrow they come across. There, there are people there. You can't put more than 10 or 12 people side by side across the width of that boat. That would mean uh, roughly, I don't know how much these pews hold, but I would expect these pews probably hold about six, seven, eight people if they all sat closely together. I would love to get us to that point where we'd have to do that even in the front row. Um, but uh, add a couple, so in other words, the boat's width actually is no more than probably from that wall to maybe, oh, maybe a foot or two into this other pew here. That's all the width of that boat. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Look at the next slide, if you would. If you count, there are 12 individuals standing side by side across the width of that boat. It was a small boat. We usually think of large boats, but in this case, it was not that at all. Quarters were extremely cramped. Now, let me give you a little more detail about this boat and this cruise. You'll like these. Of course, this might uh, dampen a little bit of your appetite, but hopefully it won't. Let's talk first about the condition of the boat uh, and the conditions on the boat as they came. And we're going to start by showing you the inside quarters where the individuals would have uh, been uh, staying. I've been down in those quarters. The height, by the way, down in there is five foot maximum. So that means most of you guys, when you're walking through there, you would have to go like this to get through it. Not very desirable by any means. Well, very crowded. Eighty people slept in this area, made to hold at the most 30 people. Every individual had, now get this, Take a tape measure and measure seven foot and then measure two foot wide. That is the total amount of room that each individual had in order to sleep, eat, dress, and do whatever else had to be done. There, were only, there was only one main cabin, which was only five feet tall. The pilgrims were wet dirty, sick, they had lice and fleas, and most of them wore the same article of clothing the entire journey and had no way of washing them. Can you imagine what you would be like if you went nine weeks in the same clothes and not having access to a bathtub or a shower? I can guarantee you that if you went that long without a bath and a shower in the same clothes, we probably wouldn't let you through the doors to come in and worship. <laughs> because we wouldn't be able to take it. <laughs> Let's go to the next picture. Talking about food, this is where the food was prepared. It would have been prepared on the second level of the boat. Doesn't that look like a nice modern kitchen for you ladies? Uh, food was uh, rarely ever cooked warm food or hot food because if there was a wind or anything like that blowing there was always the danger of a fire starting and so rarely did they have a condition where they could cook the food. So the food was mainly made up of ship's biscuits. They were dry as rocks, also called hardtack. 
dried beef, dried pork, also called salt horse, salted fish, cheese, they quickly molded, so they had blue cheese in other words, um, dried peas and beans. Now, you say that's pretty bad. Well, it got worse. Roaches, weevils, and maggots infested the hardtack, so the pilgrims preferred to eat in the dark so they couldn't see these little creatures. By dipping the hardtack into their coffee, it softened the very hard bread, but weevils would be swimming in the top of the coffee afterwards. Expecting to have warm meals on board, the pilgrims found that it was nearly impossible due to possibility of fire. Next picture. You see the little things that are off here to, the, to your left? Those were compartments in which whole families were destined to spend those nine weeks. The next picture should give you a little bit closer look at what one of those compartments was like. See how nice and big those compartments are? And you know how large the families were? Can you imagine sticking husband and just a husband and wife staying inside that little compartment, let alone your kids? And, and, and not only that, but, but, I mean, you have everything that you're bringing with you has to fit into this little section. Clothes, tools, or anything. Supplies. Well... People could bring very little due to the lack of space, one trunk per family. Included with the supplies are farming and building tools, seeds, blankets, clothing, cookware, weapons, animals, and each pilgrim family brought a Bible along. This was the Geneva 1599 edition, also a Bible box which, was, which uh, stored the Bible. They would rely on the scriptures, most especially on the treacherous voyage and in the settlement of the new colony. And by the way, there were several storms that they encountered on their way over, uh, which did not help the situation at all. As we go to the next picture, you'll see where some of the single people would stay. (laughs) I don't know, it looks to me like it might have been a little more comfortable than where some of the others were staying. They had problems, too, with the sailors. The next guy coming up here is a sailor of that time. Uh, No, this is not Santa Claus. Though I had a few say, that looks like Santa Claus. Uh, It's just because he has a red outfit on, that's all. The sailors were harsh. They swore often and found great pleasure at making fun of the pilgrims and their religious habits. They taunted them when the pilgrims got seasick referring to them as uh, glib, glabity, puke stockings, whatever that means. The sailors resented the daily prayers, the hymns, and the scripture readings sessions that the pilgrims faithfully held. Then one other thing they had to endure, and that was sickness. There was much sickness due to lack of food, good hygiene, constant wetness from the storms, The fresh water quickly became contaminated, so the only beverage they could drink was beer. That might have, by the way, that may have been the grace of God. If you think about it a minute. With the intoxication of the beer that they drank, it may have lessened some of the suffering. One boy, Pilgrim and one of the saltiest and mean-spirited sailors died on the way over. One baby was born midway, and she was named Oceanus. That's kind of name to name a baby. Well, it didn't get much better when they arrived. When they arrived, they arrived at a place where they didn't expect. Their troubles were far from being over when they decided to colonize. They spent the winter on board the ship, And 15 of the crew of 30 and 52 of the 102 settlers were dead by March. Think about that a minute. That's about five months less, four months. Over half of all that were on the boat were dead. Settlers uh, settlers then decided uh, after the winter was over, 
There was, oh, I'm sorry, during, the, during that severe winter, the lack of pro, uh, proper provisions, and at times during the winter, only two or three members were well enough to move about to tend to the needs of others. And yet, though they endured all of these terrible things, six months later, they are taking time to thank God. I cannot imagine what these people went through. How about you? I, I tried to give you a little bit of a picture of what these individuals went through in order to be able to have the freedom to worship. And even though I have described to you in verbal communication as well, showed you a few pictures, that cannot even come close to knowing what they went through and what they experienced. I do believe that probably most Christians, if given an option of either closing down the doors of their church and stop preaching and holding church services versus getting on board a ship like this for nine months or nine weeks, getting to a place where there is nothing there for which to start with, enduring half of their total being from dying from sickness, I would dare say that I would imagine that many Christians here in America would say, no thank you, we'll shut things down. You know, these people had a, they had a love and a commitment to God that puts us to shame. They were willing to endure some of the harshest conditions. They were willing to endure just about anything. Why? Just so that they could open their Bibles up with their families and they could meet together and open their Bibles up and worship God. That was so important to them that they were willing to give up absolutely everything else if it meant they had that freedom and that liberty to worship God. And I'm afraid today we're, we're pretty spoiled. It's not just Americans. I think the church as a whole, other than maybe in some areas where the church is persecuted, the church as a whole, we're, we're pretty much... I would say, pretty soft. We don't realize just what people were willing to go through in order to worship their God. Let me ask that question of you here this morning. How much would you be willing to endure in order that you might continue to worship your God? Would you be willing to be arrested in order to continue worshiping your God? Would you be willing to lose your business, your home, everything that you have in order to worship God? I find too often times we have a difficult time finding the time to make time to worship God. And I'm not just talking about Sundays. I'm talking Monday through Saturday. We allow little things, incidental things, to stand in the way of us worshiping God. These people really knew what it meant, and they were willing to sacrifice whatever it took in order to be truly that kind of a committed Christian that would be willing to go to the nth degree in order to worship their God. I've got a quick question I want to ask. We're going to scan through a couple of verses there, Meredith. We're just going to slip right through. I want to get right to the root of the question on page three. How could they be thankful after all these things happen? Let me just give you some suggestions of how I think these individuals could be thankful. Number one, they learn to be content in whatever condition they were in. Paul said this in Philippians 4, and we looked at that earlier. 
For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and hungry, both to abound and to suffer. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul's contentment in life had nothing to do with the material things of life. It had everything to do with the worship and service of a Savior. You know, Christians, that's where contentment is in life. We've got to be careful. We don't catch the world's idea that you can't be happy unless you have this new sports car or this type of home or this appliance or this gadget. Those things do not bring contentment and happiness. And where you have individuals who are discontented because God didn't give them this or God didn't give them that, where you have that kind of a situation, there will be no sense of thanksgiving. These people realize that. They realize their true happiness and contentment was in their relationship with God. And so it ought to be with each and every one of us. Number two, they didn't focus on what they didn't have. They focused on what they did have. It's like the uh, writer of the song, Count Your Many Blessings, See What God Has Done. We, I'm afraid, have a tendency to focus on what we do not have rather than what we do have. I'm not just preaching to the choir here this morning. I'm preaching to myself. I'm stepping all over my toes. Because I have found myself at times feeling pretty sorry for myself. After all, this didn't happen, or that didn't happen, or this didn't work out, or I don't have this, or I don't have that, and -and so-and-so else over here has it. God, about that time, usually grabs a hold of me, spiritually speaking, slaps me across the face a few times to get my attention, and makes me stop and think, now, wait a minute, remember all the things you do have. And when I start focusing on all the things that I do possess, and I do have, and all the things that God has done for me, all of a sudden I become thankful. And all of a sudden, the things I don't have don't seem to make as much to me. They don't seem to be as important to me. Why? Because of the blessings of God. You know, we have all kinds of things that we can turn to God to for blessings. We have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. We have eternal life. We are God's adopted children. We are co-heirs with Christ. We have more than enough food to eat, as evidenced by many of us that are here this morning. We have homes to live in, clothes to wear. We have so many things that others in this world do not have. And they've all been provided by our Lord. Number three, I think they understood the nature of God's trials. I think they understood the nature of God's trials. I think they realized that, yeah, life is not always going to be easy for a Christian. This this idea that some have given when they uh, share the gospel with others, they, they've painted up, you know, when you trust in the Lord as your Savior, everything all of a sudden becomes right. You know, it's the pie in the sky. You know, everything becomes rosy after you accepted the Lord. Have you found that to be true? I haven't. In fact, to be truthful, I'm going to tell you right now, there have been some pretty rough stints in my life, even though I knew the Lord. And you know what? Praise the Lord for every one of them. You see, they understood why God allows people to go through these kinds of things. Because you see, God always has a wonderful purpose for all that he sent us through. You know, that's, that's a great thing to grab a hold of. When you're going through a deep, dark time and, and life makes no sense and you get this feeling like God 
doesn't care. Go back and remember what the Bible says. For they who love the Lord and do his biddings, all things work to what? To what? All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. And these pilgrims said, we don't see the sense of all these people dying and all the things that we went through, and it doesn't make sense, Lord, we're just trying to worship you. No, they're not looking at it that way. They're looking at it from the standpoint, Lord, we can hardly wait to see what you're going to work out through this. God uses trials to enhance us, but also God oftentimes uses trials to enhance the lives of other Christians. The very fact that we're here this morning and we're worshiping the Lord and we don't have to fear being arrested for it all goes back to these people. As I said earlier, they are the pilgrims. They are the separatists. They were biblically in agreement pretty much with what we believe. It was they, from them, came Roger Williams who established the Baptist Church in America and also established religious freedom. And that idea caught fire in these colonies and became the rule of thumb for those living in the United States of America. If they had not done this, there may not have been a Roger Williams to establish a colony of freedom of worship. They also understood that God's trials are only for a short time and that ultimately they pay tremendous dividends. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the problem. It's, it's, it's waiting for the dividends. <laughs> I've, I've got a lot of things I'm waiting for those dividends on. But you know what? I have a suspicion. I remember my dad used to always say to me, he said, Louis, he says, as you get older, time goes faster. Russ talked a little bit about that this morning, how... Time varies a little bit, they say. Well, I think it's true. I think time does seem to go faster as you get older. But let me just say this to you. Though when you go through trials and tough times, time seems to hold still for a while. But let me just say this. Once we see the Lord, all of a sudden, the time we spent on this earth and the problems we had are all of a sudden going to seem absolutely insignificant. so short we're going to sit back and say why in the world did we complain so much why weren't we thankful <clears throat> finally they recognized their true debt that they owed God what they went through still could not compare to what Jesus went through when he died on the cross for them well Thanksgiving was established it was established by two presidents. It was first endorsed by our first president, and I'm not going to read the quote, but in 1789, George Washington established, or didn't establish, but endorsed the idea of a yearly Thanksgiving. It was not made a national holiday until our 16th president in 1863 decided that it ought to be a national holiday. It's amazing that he chose to do so because it was right in the middle of the worst war that we have ever fought, the Civil War, of a time in which there would be little to be thankful for as Lincoln writes his endorsement and his nationalization of this holiday. It is amazing as you read through it, he doesn't focus on the war. He focuses on all the things that they had to be thankful for. Even in the midst of a war that took over half a million lives, more than any of the other wars that we've ever fought, Getty understood the concept and the principle, we must thank God. We're going through some difficult times as a nation right now. I could go to Congress and tell them how to straighten out the budget, but they won't listen to me. How about you, you know? <laughs> I think it's a lot more complex than that. Some of you have had to take cuts and pay. Some of you have had to work extra, try to make ends meet. 
prices of food have gone up dramatically. It just, gasoline's gone up. I mean, it is just a struggle right now. What does God tell us to do? Be thankful. We need to learn the lesson of these pilgrims. And we need to put our focus on thanking God by learning to be content where we're at, by concentrating on what God has done, not on what he hasn't done, by recognizing that what God does and brings into our lives in these days is actually going to pay long-term dividends and will impact the lives of others. And by always recognizing that all that God asks us to go through is nothing in comparison to what he went through.